Okay, so this video is about chapter two, demand for healthcare. So we start this chapter with uh, the standard um, economic demand curves. Um, usually they are downward sloping. And the reason is that if price decreases, um, the quantity demanded should increase. Um, this simply means that if, if something is cheaper, you want more of it. Okay, if some, something is more expensive, then you want less of it. And this is an example of lollipops. Um, if the price is $3, you want four, but if it's only half dollar, then you want nine. Okay. Um, if you remember, there are two types of demand curves. One is elastic and then another one is il inelastic. We can think of it as um, necessary and unnecessary unnecessary okay um if it's a uh, very necessary things even if the price increases and gets more expensive you still need to buy it okay so that would be an inelastic demand curve which is d1 okay it looks it looks straight up um its slope is um I wouldn't say its slope is, it's slow, it doesn't have even have a slope or it's almost straight, okay. And the other one is price sensitive. This, this applies to things that you don't really need in your life, okay. Um, then when it gets more expensive, you can buy less of it, okay. We call those price sensitive or we call those, in, uh, we call those elastic demand. So our question in health economics is that, um, how about the demand for healthcare? Is that downward sloping as well? And do people with different levels of utilization end up with a different health outcomes? Okay, so this, this is de definitely two questions. The first one is, um, if it's more expensive, do people get less healthcare? Okay, um, and then the second thing is, Okay, if people do get less healthcare because it's more expensive, does that affect people's health outcomes? Okay, do people die more because they cannot afford? Or do people have worse health conditions if they cannot afford? Okay, so let's solve the first question first. Um, does the demand for healthcare um, slope downward? Okay, so we can think about um, demand for vaccines. Um, suppose um, if one vaccine costs $100 and um, people, um, people get 100 unit of vaccines. And then um, suppose the price dropped to $1 and people still get 100, um, a, a, thousand, a thousand units of vaccines. So is this elastic or inelastic? And the answer is it is inelastic because even if the price has changed so dramatically, the demand has not really changed. Okay, um, what about the demand for Band-Aids? Okay, so suppose one box of Band-Aid costs $100 um, and you observe that people buy one box of it. And another case is that um, if the Band-Aid dropped $1 per box and people now buy more, okay? People now buy 30 box of it. Okay, so then we see that this is definitely in the elastic demand because the quantity demanded or the quantity to actually get uh, purchased is sensitive to price. Okay, so how about healthcare? Think of a scenario that people always obey what their doctor suggests. So doctor suggests anything that is good for the treatment, not, um, not depending on how much money you have. And no matter what the doctor say, you always obey. Then we think of it as uh, inelastic demand, right? People, if people do whatever the doctor demands, no matter how expensive it is, then people are not responding to the price. And so this is a not price sensitive demand and, and therefore it should be inelastic. 
Okay, so we want to measure that or, or we want to find evidence about it. We want to find out if people actually respond to price or not in their healthcare decisions. And we want to run randomized experiments about it. So the definition of randomized experiment is a study that randomly assigned people to a control and treatment group or control and placebo group. And so at the end, they compare these two groups of people and draw conclusions about um, the treatment's effect. Okay, so it is nice to have a randomized control trial because if we don't run randomized experiments, we might get a biased results. So for example, um, some people, their healthcare is cheap and they don't get it because they are young. Okay, even if they think of a young person and an old person, um, this young person is healthy. So no matter how cheap is the price of the healthcare, he's not gonna buy it or she. Um, so that is low price, low demand. And for an old person, um, if he or she is not healthy and he or she purchased a lot of expensive healthcare, um, so that would be high price, high demand, right? Um, and so what do you think of that? That sounds like an upward sloping demand. And the reason of that is we did not randomize. Okay, we, we want to randomize people with different prices. We want to we want to randomize people. We don't want people to select themselves into different groups. Okay, so um, non-randomized experiment can be biased. That's why we want experiments. And in this class, we're mo mostly going to talk about two experiments. One is called RAND health insurance experiment. Uh, we call it I would call it RAND experiment. And another one is an Oregon Medicaid experiment. Um, first, the RAND experiment randomly assigned to 2,000 families from six US cities to different insurance coverage plan. Um, these are different co-payment groups. Um, we'll talk about co-payment later. And after we assign these 2,000 families randomly to these five groups, um, four groups actually, um, we're going to track how much healthcare they get, and we are also going to track um, how healthy they are. Um, Co-payment rate. Um, this is something you, you pay um, out of pocket. Um, it is something that you're responsible um, as a fraction of the Medicare, medic, medical bill. We usually call it a copayment plan as a cost, cost sharing plan. Um, the reason why it is shared because um, with a positive copayment rate, the costs are shared between the insurer, um, the insurance company and the insured patient. Um, the other experiment is called Oregon Medicaid experiments. Um, they um, actually focus on groups of low income adults. They gave them a lottery and the winners random, randomly wins and they get to apply for public health insurance through Medicaid. And we will say that Medicaid is cheaper. For those who did not win, they can't get Medicaid, but they can get somewhere else. Okay, so we are gonna take a look at the results and the results are done with sloping which is good, which, which is an evidence that people, even for healthcare, they respond to price. We have different measures of healthcare. Um, the first one is outpatient care. Um, if you don't know outpatient, it's any medical care that does not involve an overnight hospital stay. So let's say you just went to a doctor check, uh, you don't need to live in hospital. You just check everything or, um, or any other things that does, does not involve living in the hospital for one and one night. So then living in a hospital is for inpatient care. Uh, we also have ER care. This, this kind of care involves emergency rooms. We can think of if, you, if someone gets a stroke or heart attack then, and you call an ambulance, then usually you end up in an ER care. 
Okay, so how about the results? Um, in the rent study, um, we can look at this table. Um, for each row, it represents a different kind of plan. Okay, the first row is free copayment, um, and the last row is 95% copayment, which means that you almost pay everything about your medical bill. All right, how about their outpatient care? Do they go to the doctor's office the less often? Um, the answer is yes. Um, as you go down the table, okay, so you go down the table, as things get more and more expensive, um, we do see that um, people visit the hospital less often. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, it's not so obvious for the acute side of, of the equation, even though even it's acute, people still visit the hospital or the doctors less. It is more obvious for the chronic, okay? So basically, if people doesn't need to pay anything, they visit the acute care for 2.29 times. If they have to pay almost everything, they only visit it for 1.44 times. Okay, um, for the chronic kind of condition, they visit, if it's free, they visit 0.7 times on average. But if they have to pay almost everything, they, they only visit 0.46 times. Okay, so this is a clear, clear um, evidence, right? This is a clear evidence that um, we have, this is a clear evidence that we have uh, downward sloping demand curve. Oh, what's going on here? Hold on one second. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Um, how do I? Okay. Okay. So now let's look at the Oregon study. Um, okay. So the Oregon study for outpatient care, there is also a similar results for winners. 63.6% of them visit the hospital. Um, within that year. But for those who did not win, they only visit 57.4 uh, times, okay? Uh, 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 only 57.4% of them visited and number of visits uh, is also lower. Okay, so, so conclusion is both the RED study and the Oregon study find the downward sloping demand for outpatient care. So let's move into inpatient care. Um, on the left side, it's the RAND study. We can see that people who um, do not need to pay anything, their annual average visit is 0.13. And if they have to pay almost everything, it dropped down to 0.098. Um, for the Oregon Medicaid study, it says there is no significant difference in usage rates between winners and losers. Okay, so, so maybe there is some differences from 7.4 to 7.2 or from 0.103 to 0.097, but statistically, it is not a significant difference, okay? And for the RAND, it's also not a statistically significant result because we don't see any star here, okay? Um, we'll talk more about the stars in this class, but I do want to mention that if you see a star, it means it's significant in um, statistical um, estimate, okay? So we'll see some star in, in the next few slides. All right, so what is going on here? And it basically says that, okay, even if price changes, if, if you have to go live in the hospital, you will still go, okay? This is because if you have some surgery to do, 
it's not like when it gets more expensive and you don't do that surgery because that surgery is necessary for you to survive, right? Okay, so demand is still sort of downward sloping, but less elastic compared to the outpatient care due to the severity of health problem. Okay, finally, there's ER care. Um, we finally see some stars here. So if you see a star, it means that it is significant. Okay, there's the stars here. So um, for the RAND study, um, there is less chance of ER use if you have to pay more. For the Oregon study, it's not significant. There's no stars. So it says that lottery winners and losers do not have a statistically significant differences in their percentage with visits or number of visits to an ER. Okay, so, so there are some differences, but basically it says that ER is a sort of downward sloping and also sort of not so elastic demand, right? Okay. Somehow this computer is not working really well. Okay, all right. Okay, next. Um, there's one page about a Chinese rural health insurance experiment. Um, this is another setting. Um, we we'll say that this is a developing country study because it studies 26 villages. Um, there's a continuation of copayment rate that people get randomly assigned into. And we can see that as we go down the table, as people have to pay higher share of copayment, um, they, they use outpatient care much less. They, they use less inpatient care, but not as a significant, not as an obvious drop, right? Okay. So that is um, evidence that um, healthcare demand is elastic, but its elasticity depends on how urgent or how severe is the kind of care that people need. There's some more evidence. I'm gonna go through it very quick. For pediatric care, um, the RAND study found out that it is significant for people, um, for for children between zero to six years old, that um, if they have to pay a co-payment, they get less immunization and less preventative care. There is some uh, evidence for mental health dental care. Um, the RAND study find that um, um, if, you, if you have to pay more, then you spend less and you kind of like, you, you, you have let lower percentage of a free plan. Um, for dental care as well, for low income group, for low income group, um, there is a lower percent with any use of dental care and there is a lower average expenditures. It is significant because we see the star here, right? Um, it is the same for high income group. Yeah. Okay, so both low income and high income group are sensitive to the price of dental care. There is um, some more evidence about prescription drugs. Um, from the RAND study, we see that um, it is significant because there are stars. Um, people with free uh, copayment will buy more bacterial or viral condition uh, antibiotics versus the people who have to pay copayment, they will buy less. All right, um, so we also have some experiment. Uh, we also have some ex evidence from non-randomized experiment. Um, as I mentioned that non-randomized experiment evidence is sometimes biased. But there is a kind of situation that um, it could be useful and not so biased. And I would think of it as a discontinuity study. So how do we think about uh, this continuity study? Um, in the United States, citizens are eligible for health insurance through Medicare when they turn 65. 
but not before. So if you're a US citizen, you turn 65. Um, as long as you hit 65, you, elig you are eligible for Medicare, okay? Um, Medicare is a public insurance. It means that the government will use taxpayers' money to pay for your health medical bill. Um, if demand for healthcare is downward sloping, okay? It means that before your 65th birthday, you face a higher price. And once you turn 65, you simply need to pay much lower, okay? So then if it's actually downward sloping, if, if you are actually sensitive to price, then you probably will postpone some of your medical visits until you are 65, right? So think of you as someone who is almost 65 but 64, and you have to go to a den dentist visit and you don't have a health insurance at that point of time. If it's not urgent, you might think, okay, I'm sensitive of price. My demand curve is downward sloping. Then I will wait until I turn 65. Okay, so this is kind of like a continuity study that we want to see if there is an obvious jump of healthcare utilization when people turn 65. All right, so this is the graph that we need. Um, the black dots, you can think of it as utilization of healthcare that is more urgent, okay? Um, it's called unplanned emergency department admissions versus the white dots are still admissions. You still live in the hospital, but it's kind of like planned. Um, think of it as some uh, procedures that you can plan with the doctor and it's not life-threatening. You can wait one or two months to do it. Um, so we can see that there is a jump for both the black dots and the white dots, but the white dots jump is much more obvious. Okay, so, so we interpret that as an obvious um, evidence for downward sloping demand, okay. Okay, so this paper is published in 2009. Um, they have two main findings. Unplanned emergency department admissions follow a linear trend at, at around age of 65. Okay, why is there a linear trend? You can think of just, just as people get older, they, they need to go to the hospital much more often. Okay, so, so there's a linear trend on, on there. Um, while other hospital admissions that are not unplanned, that are, um, you can think of those as, let, let's say, a knee replacement, something like that, that's not life-threatening, but um, an improvement for your life quality, right? So those jump up at the age of 65. Okay, so this, this continuity in medical usage is an evidence that demand for healthcare is sensitive for price. Okay, um, can we compare demand curve? Can we compare care? Can we say one thing is more sensitive or less sensitive to price? Um, the answer is yes, we can actually calculate elasticity. Um, I believe most of you have learned it in your microeconomics class, but um, we can kind of like refresh it a little bit. Um, it's called our elasticity. Um, we want it as uh, interpretation of how much percent increase or decrease in quantity if the price increase or decrease by 1%. Okay, so this is the equation. If we put those number into the equation, um, then the elasticity for outpatient care is minus one point so minus 0.17 and the demand for dental care is minus 0.16. Okay, so then once we have a number, we can compare it. And which one is more or less elastic? Um, so um, if you look at this graph um, below minus one, uh, below minus one, you can see fresh potential 
potato restaurant meals. So these are more elastic. Okay. So fresh potato, uh, fresh tomato is the most in most elastic good. People are most sensitive to to its price. Versus what are the inelastic demand? So between zero and minus one, we, we think of those as inelastic, that um, your utilization doesn't change as much as the price change. Um, so salt is the least elastic or the most inelastic. Um, and then our care, okay, we think of all the care as inelastic. Um, so which one is more elastic? Um, we'll say outpatient care is just a tiny little bit more elastic than dental care. Okay. All right, so, so this is the end of the first question. Is the demand curve downward sloping? The next question is, okay, if people get less healthcare when it gets more expensive, does that make people less healthy? Okay, does price for care affect health outcome? And the first health outcome we look at is where do people die? Okay, Mort or mortality rates. Um, so from the Rand and Oregon study, we find no evidence or no differences between the treatment and control groups, except that there is a 10% difference of mortality rate between the high risk participants on the free and cost sharing plans. Okay, so um, this simply says that, okay, people don't die more because the price of care is more expensive, but for some people who are at very high risk, they might die more. Okay, they might die more a little bit because the price of, of the healthcare they get. Um, yep, this is the graph for the results we were just talking about. Um, we can see that um, RAND and Oregon study are not significant, but in the RAND study high risk participant, there is a star here, which, which, is, a, which is an indication that um, in these two groups, it's significant. Um, after we look at death, we are gonna look at some other health indicators, right? We, we might think of that, oh, if it's life-threatening, people get care anyway. So, um, that doesn't really affect whether they die or not. But if people cannot afford healthcare, they, they might not get things that improve their health condition. Okay, even if it's not life threatening, it does affect their, their health uh, conditions or quality of life. Okay, so we look at these health indicators in the RAND study. Okay, we see that some of them are significant that there's a star next to the number. Um, the diastolic blood pressure is higher for people who needs to pay money. Um, the vision, far vision, near vision is higher. Higher, right? Uh, I don't know how, how do you interpret that? It's higher for people who have, have to pay for co-payment, okay. And the other things are uh, not significant. Okay, so then in the Oregon study, um, it's more significant, we see more stars. Um, the only thing that does not have a star is the death. It's survival rate one year after lottery. So people don't die more if they win or lose the lottery. But if you lose the lottery, you have a lower self-reported health, you have um, less days that you think you are physically and mentally healthy, and you have a lower rate um, that in the last two weeks that you feel that you're depressed. Okay, so there is some differences between the RAND and the Oregon study, right? It seems like, so first of all, both of them show not no evidence for uh, mortality rates between winners and losers or between the prices. But um, some conditions are sensitive to price. Um, seems like the Oregon participants are more um, subject to the price in terms of their health condition. 
And we think of that as because these two group of people are a little bit different. The RAND study focused on um, people who are a much broader cross-section of the US versus the Oregon study focused on people who have a lower income. So, so that makes sense, right? Um, lower income people are more sensitive to price. And once the price of healthcare changes a lot, their health condition will be more sensitive in that in that in that sense. Okay, so that's it. Um, conclusion: First, demand curve is downward sloping. Um, we'll practice how to calculate um, elasticity and compare that in our practice class. Um, but generally, price of healthcare does not seem to affect one's health. Um, exception is that price seems to affect people who are most vulnerable, right? People who have high risk of uh, conditions or people who are lower income. Um, so we should think about policy and health insurance implications behind this. So if we want to make it less expensive, should we do that to in, in, in the more urgent or severe conditions? Um, for things that are uh, not so necessary, which is which is more elastic demand, um, can we make it like more expensive so that people don't have inefficient use of healthcare? Okay, so that people don't go to the hospital just because they they feel like going it and it's free. Okay, so so we'll talk about those in our future um, lectures.